Chapter Twenty Six of Historical Tales, Volume Eight, Russian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Historical Tales, Volume Eight, Russian, by Charles Morris. Chapter Twenty Six. A magical transformation scene. Catherine the Great earned her title cheaply her patent of greatness being due to the fact that she had the judgment to select great generals and a great minister and the wisdom to cling to them russia grew powerful during her reign largely through the able work of her generals and she forgave potemkin a thousand insults and unblushing robberies in view of his successful statesmanship potemkin possessed in addition to his ability as a statesman the faculty of a spectacular artist and arranged for a show for the empress which stands unrivalled amid the triumphs of the stage it is the tale of this spectacle which we propose to tell catherine had literary aspirations one of her admirations being voltaire with whom she corresponded and on whom she depended to chronicle the glory of her reign the poet had his dreams in which the woman shared and between them they contrived a scheme of a modern utopia a russo-grecian city of whose civilization the empress was to be the source and which a decree was to raise from the desert and an idea make great this fancy potemkin who stood ready to flatter the empress at any price undertook to realize and he built her a city in the fashion in which cities were built in the times of the arabian nights and made it flourish in the same unsubstantial fashion the magnificent potemkin never hesitated before any question of cost russia was rich and could bleed freely to please the empress's whim he therefore ordered a city to be built with dwellings and edifices of every description common to the cities of that date stores palaces public halls private residences in profusion the buildings ready he sought for citizens and forcibly drove the people from all quarters to take up a temporary residence within its walls it was his one purpose to make a spectacle of this theatrical city to enchant the eyes of the empress so that it had an appearance of prosperity during her visit he cared not a fig if it fell to pieces and its inhabitants vanished as soon as his supporting hand was removed he only required that the scene should be set and the actors in place when the curtain rose and the city grew on the banks of the dnieper eighteen million roubles being granted by the empress for its cost though much of this clung to the bird lime of avarice on potemkin's fingers it was named kherson the desert around it was erected into a province entitled by the wily minister catherine's glory slava ekaterina another province farther north he named after his imperial mistress ekaterinoslav and thus by fraud and violence a city to order was brought into existence the stage was ready the next thing to be done was to raise the curtain which hid it from catherine's eyes it was early in the year seventeen eighty seven that the empress began her journey towards her utopian city to receive the homage of its citizens and to exhibit to the world the magnificence of her reign great projects were in the air poland had just been cut into fragments and distributed among the hungry kingdoms around the same was to be done with turkey joseph the second of austria was to meet the empress in kherson to consult upon this partition of the turkish empire while constantine grand duke of russia and grandson of the empress was to reign at byzantium or constantinople over the new empire carved from the turkish realm such was the paper programme prepared by potemkin and the empress the minister doubtless smiling behind his sleeve his mistress in solid earnest and now we have the story to tell of one of the most marvellous journeys ever undertaken it was made through a thinly inhabited wilderness which to the belief of the empress was to be converted into a populous and thriving realm that the journey might proceed by night as well as by day great piles of wood were prepared at intervals of fifty perches whose leaping flames gave to the high road a brightness like that of day in six days smolensk was reached and in twenty days the old russian capital of kiev where the procession halted for a season 
before proceeding towards its goal as it went on the whole country became transformed the deserts were suddenly peopled palaces awaited the train in the trackless wild temporary villages hid the nakedness of the plain and fireworks at night testified to the seeming joy of the populace wide roads were opened by the army in advance of the cortege the mountains were illuminated as it passed howling wildernesses were made to appear like fertile gardens and great flocks and herds gathered from distant pastures delighted the eyes of the empress with the appearance of thrift and prosperity as her vehicle drove rapidly along the roads to the charmed eyes of those not to the manner born the whole country seemed populous and prosperous the people joyous the soil fertile the land smiling with abundance there was no hint to indicate that it was a desert covered for the time being by an enamelled carpet the dnieper reached the empress and her train passed down that river in fifteen splendid galleys with the pomp of a triumphal procession it was now the month of may and the banks of the river showed the same signs of prosperity as had the sides of the road at kadok the emperor joseph met the empress having reached kherson in advance and gone north to anticipate her coming he accompanied her down the stream looking with her on the show of prosperity and populousness which delighted her inexperienced eyes and smiling covertly at the delusion which potemkin's magic had raised well assured that as soon as she had passed silence and desertion would succeed these busy scenes at a new projected town on the way of which catherine had with much ceremony laid the first stone joseph was asked to lay the second he did so afterwards saying of the farcical proceeding the empress of russia and i have finished a very important business in a single day she has laid the first stone of a city and i have laid the last he had no doubt that when they had gone the buildings in which they had slept the villages which they had seen the wayside herders and flocks would vanish like theatrical scenery and the country present the dismal aspect of a deserted stage at length the new city was reached the magical curson catherine entered it in grand state under a noble triumphal arch inscribed in greek with the words the way to byzantium it was a busy city in which she found herself the houses were all inhabited shops filled with goods lined the principal streets people thronged the sidewalks spectators of the entry luxury of every kind awaited the empress in the capital which had arisen for her as by the rubbing of aladdin's ring and entertainments of the most lavish character were prepared by the potent genius to whom all she saw was due potemkin hesitated at no expense the journey had cost the empire no less than seven millions of roubles fourteen thousand of which were expended on the throne built for the empress in what was named the admiralty of kherson such was the scenery prepared for one of the most theatrical events the world has ever witnessed it cost the empire dearly but potemkin's purpose was achieved he had charmed the empress by causing the desert to blossom like the rose and after the spectators had passed all sank again into silence and emptiness the new empire of byzantium remained a dream turkey had not been consulted in the project and was not quite ready to consent to be dismembered to gratify the whim of empress and emperor as for the city of kherson its site was badly chosen and its seeming prosperity and populousness during the empress's presence quickly passed away the city has remained but its actual growth has been gradual and it has been thrown into the shade by odessa a port founded some years later without a single flourish of trumpets but which has now grown to be the fourth city of russia in size and importance of late years kherson has shown some signs of increase but all we need say further of it here is that it has the honour of being the burial place of the shrewd potemkin under whose fostering hand it burst into such premature bloom in its early days End of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of historical tales volume eight russian this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris. Chapter 27. Kosciusko and the Fall of Poland. Of the several nations that made up the Europe of the 18th century, one, the Kingdom of Poland, vanished before the 19th century began. Destitute of a strong central government, the scene of continual anarchy among the turbulent nobles, possessing no national frontiers and no national middle class, its population being made up of nobles, serfs, and foreigners, it lay at the mercy of the ambitious surrounding kingdoms by which it was finally absorbed. On three successive occasions was the territory of the feeble nation divided between its foes, the first partition being made in 1772 between Russia, Prussia, and Austria, the second in 1793 between Russia and Prussia, and the third and final in 1795 in which Russia, Prussia, and Austria again took part, all that remained of the country being now distributed and the ancient kingdom of Poland effaced from the map of Europe. Only one vigorous attempt was made to save the imperiled realm, that of the illustrious Kosciusko who, though he failed in his patriotic purpose, made his name famous as the noblest of the Poles. When he appeared at the head of its armies, Poland was in a desperate strait. Some of its own nobles had been bought by Russian gold, Russian armies had overrun the land, and a Prussian force was marching to their aid. At Grodno the Russian general proudly took his seat on that throne which he was striving to overthrow. The defenders of Poland had been dispersed, their property confiscated, their families reduced to poverty. The Russians swarming through the kingdom committed the greatest excesses, while Warsaw, which had fallen into their hands, was governed with arrogant barbarity. Such was the state of affairs when some of the most patriotic of the nobles assembled and sent to Kosciusko, asking him to put himself at their head. As a young man this valiant Pole had aided in the war for American independence. In 1792 he took part in the war for the defense of his native land, but he declared that there could be no hope of success unless the peasants were given their liberty. Hitherto they had been treated in Poland like slaves. It was with these despised serfs that this effort was made. In 1794 the insurrection broke out. Kosciusko, finding that the country was ripe for revolt against its oppressors, hastened from Italy whither he had retired and appeared at Krakow, where he was hailed as the coming deliverer of the land. The only troops in arms were a small force of about four thousand and all, who were joined by about three hundred peasants armed with scythes. These were soon met by an army of seven thousand Russians, whom they put to flight after a sharp engagement. The news of this battle stirred the Russian general in command at Warsaw to active measures. All whom he suspected of favoring the insurrection were arrested. The result was different from what he had expected. The city blazed into insurrection. Two thousand Russians fell before the onslaught of the incensed patriots, and their general saved himself only by flight. The outbreak at Warsaw was followed by one at Vilna, the capital of Lithuania, the Russians here being all taken prisoners. Three Polish regiments mustered into the Russian service deserted to the army of their compatriots, and far and wide over the country the flames of insurrection spread. Kosciusko rapidly increased his forces by recruiting the peasantry, whose dress he wore and whose food he shared in. But these men distrusted the nobles who had so long oppressed them, while many of the latter, eager to retain their valued prerogatives, worked against the patriot cause in which they were aided by King Stanislaus, who had been subsidized by Russian gold. To put down this effort of despair on the part of the Poles, Catherine of Russia sent fresh armies to Poland led by her ablest generals. Prussians and Austrians also joined in the movement for enslavement. Frederick William of Prussia fighting at the head of his troops against the Polish patriot. Kosciusko had established a provisional government and he faced his foes boldly in the field. Defeated, he fell back on Warsaw, where he valiantly maintained himself until threatened by two new Russian armies, whom he marched out to meet in the hope of preventing their junction. The decisive battle took place at Machiavita in October 1794. 
Kosciusko, though pressed by superior forces, fought with the greatest valor and desperation. His men at length, overpowered by numbers, were in great part cut to pieces or obliged to yield, while their leader, covered with wounds, fell into the hands of his foes. It is said that he exclaimed on seeing all hopes at an end, Finis Polonai, in the words of the poet Byron, freedom shrieked when Kosciusko fell. Warsaw still held out. Here all who had escaped from the field took refuge, occupying Praga, the eastern suburb of the city where twenty-six thousand Poles, with over one hundred cannon and mortars, defended the bridges over the Vistula. Suaro, the greatest of the Russian generals, was quickly at the city gates. He was weaker both in men and in guns than the defenders of the city, but with his wonted impetuosity he resolved to employ the same tactics which he had more than once used against the Turks, and seek to carry the Polish lines at the bayonet's point. After a two days' cannonade he ordered the assault at daybreak of November the 4th. A desperate conflict continued during the five succeeding hours, ending in the carrying of the trenches and the defeat of the garrison. The Russians now poured into the suburb, where a scene of frightful carnage began. Not only men in arms, but old men, women, and children were ruthlessly slaughtered, the wooden houses set on fire, the bridges broken down, and the throng of helpless people who sought to escape into the city driven ruthlessly into the waters of the Vistula. In this butchery not only ten thousand soldiers, but twelve thousand citizens of every age and sex were remorselessly slain. On the following day the city capitulated, and on the sixth the Russian victors marched into its streets. It was, as Kosciusko had said, the end of Poland. The troops were disarmed, the officers were seized as prisoners, and the feeble king was nominally raised again to the head of the kingdom, so soon to be swept from existence. For a year Suaro held a military court in Warsaw, far eclipsing the king in the splendor of his surroundings. By the close of 1795 all was at an end. The small remnant left of the kingdom was parted between the greedy aspirants, and on the 1st of January 1796 Warsaw was handed over to Prussia, to whose share of the spoils it appertained. In this arbitrary manner was a kingdom which had an area of nearly 300,000 square miles and a population of 12 millions, and whose history dated back to the 10th century, removed from the map of the world while the heavy hand of oppression fell upon all who dared to speak or act in its behalf. One bold stroke for freedom was afterwards made, but it ended as before, and Poland is now but a name. End of chapter 27 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 28 of Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris. Chapter 28. Suwaro the Unconquerable. Of men born for battle, to whose ears the roar of cannon and the clash of sabers are the only music, the smoke of conflict their native atmosphere, Suwaro, Suvarov, to give him his Russian name, stands among the foremost, a little wrinkled stooping man, five feet four inches in height, and sickly in appearance. He was the last to whom one would have looked for great deeds in war or mighty exploits in the embattled field, yet he had the soul of a hero in his diminutive frame and even as a boy the passion for military glory fired his heart caesar and charles the twelfth of sweden from which country his ancestors came being the heroes worshipped by his youthful imagination born in seventeen twenty nine he entered the army as a private at seventeen but rapidly rose from the ranks made himself famous in the seven years war and in the Polish War of 1768 to 1771, and from that time until death put an end to his career, was almost constantly in the field. Napoleon, against whose armies he fought in his later days, was not more enraptured with the breath of battle than was this war-dog of the Russian army. 
diminutive and sickly as he looked suwarrow was strong and hardy and so inured to hardship that the severity of the russian climate failed to affect his vigorous frame disdaining luxury and ignoring comfort he lived like the soldiers under his command preferring to sleep on a truss of hay and accepting every privation which his men might be called on to endure he was a man of high intelligence a clever linguist and a diligent reader even when on campaign and religiously seems to have been very devout being ready to kneel and pray before every wayside image even when the roads were deep with mud in his ordinary manners he carried eccentricity to an extravagant extent was brusque and curt in speech often to the verge of insult laconic in his dispatches and a soldier in grain treated with stinging sarcasm all whose lack of activity or of courage invited his contempt it was by this spirit that he incurred the enmity of the emperor paul when in his half-mad thirst for change the latter attempted to change the native dress of the russian soldier for the ancient attire of germany his fair locks which the russian was used to wash every morning he was now bidden to bedaub with grease and flour while he energetically cursed the black spatter dashes which it took him an hour to button every morning orders to establish these novelties among his men were sent to suwarrow then in italy with the army the directions being accompanied with little sticks for models of the tails and side curls in which the soldier's hair was to be arranged the old warrior's lips curled contemptuously on seeing these absurd devices and he growled out in his curt fashion hair powder is not gunpowder curls are not cannon and tails are not bayonets this sarcastic utterance which forms a sort of rhyming verse in the russian tongue got abroad and spread from mouth to mouth through the army like a choice morsel of wit the czar to whose ears it came heard it with deep offence soon after suwaro was recalled from the army on another plea and on his return to st petersburg was not permitted to see the emperor's face this injustice may have been a cause of his death which occurred shortly after his return on may eighteenth eighteen hundred no courtier of the russian court and no diplomatist except the english ambassador followed the war-worn veteran to the grave suwarrow was the idol of his men whose favorite title for him was father suvarov and who were ready at command to follow him to the cannon's mouth in all his long career he never lost a battle and only once in his life of war acted on the defensive with a superb faith in his own star the inspiration of the moment served him for counsel and rapidity of movement and boldness and dash in the onset brought him many a victory where deliberation might have led to defeat a striking instance of this and of his usual brusque eccentricity took place in seventeen ninety nine in italy where suwarrow was placed in command of all the allied troops this raising of a russian to the supreme command excited the jealousy of the austrian generals and they called a council of war to examine his plan for the campaign the members of the council the youngest first gave their views as to the conduct of the war suwarrow listened in grim silence until they had all spoken and had turned to him for his comment on their views the wrinkled veteran drew to himself a slate and made on it two lines here gentlemen he said pointing to one line are the french and here are the russians the latter will march against the former and beat them this said he rubbed out the french line then looking up at his surprised auditors he curtly remarked this is all my plan the council is ended in war he is said to have been averse to the shedding of blood and to have been at heart humane and merciful yet this hardly accords with the story of his exploits it being said that twenty six thousand turks were killed in the storming of ismail while in that of praga at warsaw more than twenty thousand poles were massacred such was the character of one of the men who aided to make glorious the reign of catherine of russia 
whose merit she, unlike her weak son Paul, was fully competent to appreciate. With this estimate of the greatest soldier Russia has ever produced, and one of the ablest generals of modern times, we may briefly describe some of the most striking exploits of Suaro's career. In 1789, during one of the interminable wars against Turkey, in which on this occasion the Austrians took part with the Russians, the Prince of Kohlberg was at the head of an Austrian force which he was strikingly incapable of commanding. The Prince, advancing with sublime deliberation, found himself suddenly threatened by a considerable Turkish army. Filled with alarm at the sight of the enemy, he sent a hasty appeal to Suwaro to come to his aid. The Russian general had just rejoined his army after recovering from a wound. The news of Coburg's peril reached him at Balak, in Moldavia, between forty and fifty of miles away. And these miles of mountains, ravines, and almost impassable wilds. Suwaro at once broke camp and with his usual impetuosity led his army over its difficult route, reaching the Austrians in less than thirty-six hours after receiving the news. It was five o'clock in the morning when he arrived. At eleven he sent his plan of attack to the prince. An assault on the enemy was to be made at two in the morning. Kohlberg, who had never dreamed of such rapidity of movement and such impetuosity in action, was utterly astounded. In complete bewilderment, he sought Suwaro at his quarters, going there three times without finding him. The supreme command belonged to him as the older general, but he had the sense not to claim it, and to act as a subordinate to his abler ally. In an hour after the advance began, the allied armies were in the Turkish camp, and the Turks, though much outnumbering their assailants, were in full flight. All their stores, a hundred standards, and seventy pieces of artillery fell into the hands of the victors. Suaro returned to Moldavia, and Coburg looked quietly on while the Turks collected a new army. In less than two months he found himself confronted by a hundred thousand men. In new alarm he hastily sent again to Suaro for aid. In two days the Russian army had reached the Austrian camp, which the enemy was just about to attack. The Turks had neglected to fortify their camp before offering battle. Of this oversight, the keen-eyed Russian took instant advantage, attacking them in their unfinished trenches, and as before, took their camp by storm, though after a more stubborn defense than in the previous instance. The Turkish army was again dispersed. Immense booty was taken, and Suwaro received for his valor the title of a Count of the Austrian Empire while the Empress Catherine gave him in reward the honorable surname of Remixki, from the name of the river on which the battle had been fought. The next great exploit of Suwaro was performed at Ismail, a Turkish town which Potemkin had been besieging for seven months. The Prime Minister at length grew impatient at the delay, and determined on more effective measures. Living in a luxury in his camp that contrasted strangely with the sparse conditions of Suwaro, Potemkin was surrounded by courtiers and ladies, who made strenuous efforts to furnish the great man with amusement. One of the ladies, handling a pack of cards from which she laughingly pretended to be able to read the secrets of destiny, proclaimed that he would be in possession of the town at the end of three weeks. "'You are not bad at prediction,' said Potemkin with a smile but I have a method of divination far more infallible. My prediction is that I will have the town in three days. He at once sent orders to Suwaro, who was at Galatz, to come and take the town. The obedient warrior, who seemed to be always at somebody's beck and call, quickly appeared and surveyed the situation. His first steps seemed to indicate that he proposed to continue the siege, the troops being formed into a besieging army of about 40,000 men while the Russian fleet was ordered up to the town. But the deliberation of a siege never accorded with Suwaro's ardent humor. His real purpose was to take the place by storm. He had taken Ochakov in this way the previous year with heavy loss, and with the slaughter of 20,000 Turks. He now, on the 21st of September, twice summoned the city to surrender, threatening the people with the fate of Ochakov. They refused to yield and the assault began at four o'clock. 
of the following morning. Battalion after battalion was hurled against the walls. The slaughter from the Turkish fire was frightful, but the stern commander hurled ever new hosts into the pit of death, and about eight o'clock the summit of the walls was reached. But the work was yet only begun. The city was defended street by street, house by house. It was noon before the Russians, fighting their way through a desperate resistance, reached the marketplace, where were gathered a body of the Tartars of the Crimea. For two hours these fought fiercely for their lives, and after they had all fallen, the Turks kept up the conflict with equal desperation in the streets. At length the gates were thrown open, and Suwaro sent his cavalry into the city, who charged through the streets, cutting down all whom they met. It was four o'clock in the afternoon when the butchery ended, after which the city was given up for three days to the mercy of the troops. According to the official report, the Turks lost 43,000 in killed and prisoners, the Russians 4,500 in all, and one estimate probably is much too large, as the other was too small. We may conclude with the story of Suwaro's career in Italy and Switzerland against the armies of the French Republic. The plan which the Russian conqueror had marked out on the slate for the Austrian generals was literally fulfilled. In less than three months he had cleared Lombardy and Piedmont of the troops of France. He forced the passage of the Ada against Moreau and his army, compelling the French to abandon Milan, which he entered in triumph. His next success was at Turin, a depot of French supplies, towards which Moreau was hastily advancing. The Russians took the city by surprise, driving the French garrison into the citadel and capturing 300 cannons and enormous quantities of muskets, ammunition, and military stores. The French army was saved from ruin only by the great ability of its commander, who led it to Genoa in four days over a mountain path. The Tsar of Paul rewarded his victorious general with the honorable designation of Italianski, or the Italian, and, in his grandiloquent fashion, issued a ukaz commanding all people to regard Suwaro as the greatest commander the world had ever known. We cannot describe the whole course of events. Other victories were won in Italy, but finally Suwaro was weakened by the jealousy of the Austrians, who withdrew their troops and subsequently was obliged to go to the relief of his fellow commander, Korsakoff, who, with 20,000 men, had imprudently allowed himself to be hemmed in by a French army at Zurich. He finally forced his way through the enemy, losing all his artillery and half his host. Of this Suaro knew nothing, as he made his way across the Alps to the aid of the beleaguered general. He attempted to force his way over the St. Gothard Pass, meeting with fierce opposition at every point. There was a sharp fight at the Devil's Bridge, which the French blew up, but failed to keep back Suaro and his men, who crossed the rocky gorge of the Unerloch, dashing through the foaming roofs, and drove the French from their posts of vantage. At length, with his men barefoot, his provisions almost exhausted, the Russian general reached Muta, to find to his chagrin that Korsakov had been defeated and put to flight. He at once began his retreat, followed in force by Messina, who was driven off by the rear guard. On October 1st, Suaro reached Galeris, where he rested till the 4th, then crossed the Panixer Mountains through the snow two feet deep to the valley of the Rhine, which he reached on the 10th, having lost 200 of his men and all his beasts of burden over the precipices, thus ending this extraordinary march, which had cost Suaro all his artillery nearly all his horses and a third of his men these losses in the russian armies stirred the czar to immeasurable rage all the missing officers who were prisoners in france were branded as deserters and suwaro was deprived of his command ostensibly for his failure but largely for the sarcasm already mentioned he returned home to die having experienced what a misfortune it is for a great man to be at the mercy of a fool in authority End of chapter 28 Suwaro the Unconquerable Recording by Peter Strom, Sabetha, Kansas, on August 13, 2018
Volume 8, Russian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris. Chapter 29. The Retreat of Napoleon's Grand Army. In the spring of 1812, Napoleon reached the frontiers of Russia at the head of the greatest army that had ever been under his command, it embracing half a million of men. It was not an army of Frenchmen, however, since much more than half the total force was made up of Germans and soldiers of other nationalities. In addition to the soldiery was a multitude of non-combatants and other encumbrances which Napoleon, deviating from his usual custom, allowed to follow the troops these were made up of useless aids to the pomp and luxury of the emperor and his officers and an incredible number of private vehicles women servants and others who served but to create confusion and to consume the army stores of which provision had been made for only a short campaign thus dragging its slow length along the army on june twenty fourth eighteen twelve crossed the nyman river and entered upon russian soil from emperor to private all were inspired with exaggerated hopes of victory and looked soon to see the mighty empire of the north prostrate before the genius of all-conquering france had the vision of that army as it was to recross the nyman within six months risen upon their minds it would have been dismissed as a nightmare of false and monstrant mien onward into russia wound the vast and hopeful mass without a battle and without sight of a foe the russians were retreating and drawing their foes deeper and deeper into the heart of their desolate land battles were not necessary the country itself fought for russia food was not to be had from the land which was devastated in their track burning cities and villages lit up their path the carriages and wagons even many of the cannon had to be left behind the forced marches which napoleon made in hope of overtaking the russians forced him to abandon much of his supplies while men and horses sank from fatigue and hunger the decaying carcasses of ten thousand horses already poisoned the air at length moscow was approached here the russian leaders were forced by the sentiment of the army and the people to strike one blow in defence of their ancient capital a desperate encounter took place at borodino two days march from the city in which napoleon triumphed but at a fearful price forty thousand men had fallen of whom the wounded nearly all died through want and neglect when moscow was reached it proved to be deserted napoleon had won the empty shell of a city and was as far as ever from the conquest of russia it is not our purpose here to give the startling story of the burning of moscow the sacrifice of a city to the god of war though this is one of the most thrilling events in the history of russia it has already been told in this series we are concerned at present solely with the retreat of the grand army from the ashes of the muscovite capital the most dreadful retreat in the annals of war napoleon lingered amid the ruins of the ancient city until winter was near at hand hoping still that the emperor alexander would sue for peace no suit came he offered terms himself and they were not even honored with a reply a deeply disappointed man the autocrat of europe marched out of moscow on october nineteenth and began his frightful homeward march he had waited much too long the russian armies largely increased in numbers shut him out from every path but the wasted one by which he had come a highway marked by the ashes of burnt towns and the decaying corpses of men and animals on november sixth winter suddenly set in the supplies had largely been consumed the land was empty of food famine alternated with cold to crush the retreating host and death in frightful forms hovered over their path the horses half fed and worn out died by thousands most of the cavalry had to go afoot the booty brought from moscow was abandoned as valueless even much of the artillery was left behind the cold grew more intense a deep snow covered the plain through whose white peril they had to drag their weary feet arms were flung away as useless weights flight was the only thought and but a tithe of the army remained in condition to defend the rest the retreat of the grand army 
became one of incredible distress and suffering over the seemingly endless russian steppes from whose snow-clad level only rose here and there the ruin of a deserted village the freezing and starving soldiers made their miserable way wan hollow-eyed gaunt clad in garments through which the biting cold pierced their flesh they dragged wearily onward fighting with one another for the flesh of a dead horse ready to commit murder for the shadow of food and finally sinking in death in the snow of that interminable plain each morning some of those who had stretched their limbs round the bivouac fires failed to rise the victims of the night were often revealed only by the small mounds of fallen snow which had buried them as they slept but this picture may not be thought overdrawn we shall relate an anecdote told of prince emilius of darmstadt he had fallen asleep in the snow and in order to protect him from the keen north wind four of his hessian dragoons screened him during the night with their cloaks the prince arose from his cold couch in the morning to find his faithful guardians still in the position they had occupied during the night frozen to death maddened with fr famine and frost men were seen to spring with wildly exulting cries into the flames of burning houses of those that fell into the hands of the russian boars many were stripped of their clothing and chased to death through the snow smolensk which the army had passed in its glory it now reached in its gloom the city was deserted and half burned most of the cannon had been abandoned food and ammunition were lacking and no halt was possible the despairing army pushed on death followed the fugitives in other forms than those of frost and hunger the russians who had avoided the army in its advance harassed it continually in its retreat from all directions russian troops marched upon the worn-out fugitives grimly determined that not a man of them should leave russia if they could prevent the intrepid ney with the men still capable of fight formed the rearguard and kept at bay their foes this service was one of imminent peril cut off at smolensk from the main body only ney's vigilance saved his men from destruction during the night he led them rapidly along the banks of the Dnieper, repulsing the russian corps that sought to cut off his retreat and joined the army again the beresina at length was reached this river must be crossed but the frightful chill which hitherto had pursued the fleeing host now inopportunely decreased a thaw broke the frozen surface of the stream and the fugitives gazed with horror on masses of floating ice where they had dreamed of a solid pathway for their feet the slippery state of the banks added to the difficulty while on the opposite side a russian army commanded the passage with its artillery and in the rear the roar of cannon signalled the approach of another army all seemed lost and only the good fortune which had so often befriended him now saved napoleon and his host for at this critical moment a fresh army corps which had been left behind in his advance came to the emperor's aid and the russian general who disputed the passage deceived by the french movements withdrew to another point on the stream taking instant advantage of the opportunity napoleon threw two bridges across the river over which the able-bodied men of the army safely made their way after them came the vast host of non-combatants that formed the rear choking the bridges with their multitude as they struggled to cross the pursuing russian army appeared and opened with artillery upon the helpless mass ploughing long red lanes of carnage through its midst one bridge broke down and all rushed to the other multitudes were forced into the stream while the russian cannon played remorselessly upon the struggling and drowning mass for two days the passage had continued and on the morning of the third a considerable number of sick and wounded soldiers sutlers women and children still remained behind when word reached them that the bridges were to be burned a fearful rush now took place some succeeded in crossing but the fire ran rapidly along the timbers and the despairing multitude leaped into the icy river or sought to plunge through the mounting flames when the ice thawed in the spring twelve thousand dead bodies were found on the shores of the stream sixteen thousand of the fugitives remained prisoners in russian hands this day of disaster was the climax of the frightful retreat but as the army pressed onward the temperature again fell until it reached twenty seven degrees below zero and the old story of frozen to death was resumed 
napoleon fearing to be taken prisoner in germany if the truth should become known left his army on december fifth and hurried towards paris with all speed leaving the news of the disaster behind in his flight wilna was soon after reached by the army but could not be held by the exhausted troops and with its crowded magazines and the wealth in its treasury fell into the hands of the russians during this season of disaster the austrian and prussian commanders left behind to guard the route contrived to spare their troops schwarzenberg the austrian commander retreated towards warsaw and left the russian armies free to act against the french the prussians who had been engaged in the siege of riga might have covered the fleeing host but york their commander entered into a truce with the russians and remained stationary they had been forced to join the french and took the first opportunity to abandon their hated allies a place of safety was at length reached but the grand army was represented by a miserable fragment of its mighty host of the half million who crossed the russian frontier but eighty thousand returned of those who had reached moscow the meagre remnant numbered scarcely twenty thousand in all end of chapter twenty nine recording by peter strom sabetha kansas on july twenty ninth two thousand eighteen chapter thirty of historical tales volume eight russian this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org historical tales volume eight russian by charles morris chapter thirty the death struggle of poland the french revolution of eighteen thirty precipitated a similar one in poland the rule of russia in that country had been one of outrage and oppression in the words of the poles personal liberty which had been solemnly guaranteed was violated the prisons were crowded courts martial were appointed to decide in civil cases and imposed infamous punishments upon citizens whose only crime was that of having attempted to save from corruption the spirit and the character of the nation on the twenty ninth of november the people sprang to arms in warsaw and the russians were driven out soon after a dictator was chosen an army collected and russian poland everywhere rose in revolt it was a hopeless struggle into which the polish patriots had entered in all europe there was not a hand lifted in their aid prussia and austria stood in a threatening attitude each with an army of sixty thousand men upon the frontiers ready to march to the aid of russia if any disturbance took place in their polish provinces russia invaded the country with an army of one hundred and twenty thousand men a force more than double that which poland was able to raise and the polish army was commanded by a titled incapable prince radzivill chosen because he had a great name regardless of his lack of ability as a soldier klapiki his aide was a skilled commander but he fought with his hands tied on the nineteenth of february eighteen thirty one the two armies met in battle and began a desperate struggle which lasted with little cessation for six days warsaw lay in the rear of the polish army behind it flowed the vistula with but a single bridge for escape in case of defeat victory or death seemed the alternatives of the patriot force the struggle was for the alderwood the key of the position for the possession of this force the fight was hand to hand again and again it was lost and retaken on the twenty fifth the final day of the battle it was held by the poles forty-five thousand in number they were confronted by a russian army of one hundred thousand men divitch the russian commander determined to win the alderwood at any cost klopeki gave orders to defend it to the last extremity the struggle that seceded was desperate by sheer force of numbers the russians made themselves masters of the wood then klopeki putting himself at the head of his grenadiers charged into the forest depths driving out its holders at the bayonet's point their retreat threw the whole russian line into confusion 
Now was the critical moment for a cavalry charge. Kopiki sent orders to the cavalry chief, but he refused to move. This loss of an opportunity for victory maddened the valiant leader. Go and ask Radzivill, he said to the aides who asked for orders. For me, I seek only death. Plunging into the ranks of the enemy, he was wounded by a shell and borne secretly from the field. But the news of this disaster ran through the ranks and through the whole army into consternation. The fall of the gallant Klopiki changed the tide of battle. Fiercely struggling still, the poles were driven from the wood and hurled back upon the Vistula. A battalion of recruits crossed the river on the ice and carried terror into Warsaw. Crowds of peasants, heaps of dead and dying, choked the approach to Praga, the outlying suburb. Night fell upon the scene of disorder. The houses of Praga were fired, and flames lit up the frightful scene. Groans of agony and shrieks of despair filled the air. The streets were choked with debris, but workmen from Warsaw rushed out with axes, cleared away the room, and left the passages free. Inspirated by this, the infantry formed in line and checked the charge of the Russian horse. The Albert cuirassiers rode through the first Polish line, but soon found their horses floundering in mud, and themselves attacked by lancers and pikemen on all sides. Of the brilliant and daring corps, scarce a man escaped. That day cost the Poles five thousand men. Of the Russians, more than ten thousand fell. Radzivill, fearing that the single bridge would be carried away by the broken ice, gave orders to retreat across the stream. Dybitz withdrew into the wood, and thus the first phase of the struggle for the freedom of Poland came to an end. This affair was followed by a striking series of Polish victories. The ice in the Vistula was running free. The river overflowed its banks, and for a month the main body of the armies were at rest. But General Dwarniki, at the head of 3,000 Polish cavalry, signalized the remainder of February by a series of brilliant exploits, attacking and dispersing with his small force 20,000 of the enemy. Radzivill, whose incompetency had grown evident, was now removed, and Shrizneki, a much abler leader, was chosen in his place. He was not long in showing his skill and daring. On the night of March 30th, the Praga Bridge was covered with straw, and the army marched noiselessly across. At daybreak, in the midst of a thick fog, it fell on a body of sleeping Russians, who had not dreamed of such a movement. Hurled back in disorder and dismay, they were met by a division, which had been posted to cut off their retreat. The rout was complete. Half the corps was destroyed or taken and the remainder fled in terror through the forest depths. Before the day ended, the Poles came upon Rossin's division, 15,000 in number and strongly posted, yet the impetus onslaught of the Poles swept the field. The Russians were driven back in other rout. With the loss of 2,000 men, 6,000 prisoners, and large quantities of cannon and arms, the Poles lost but 300 men in this brilliant success. During the next day, the pursuit continued, and 5,000 more prisoners were taken. So disheartened were the Russian troops by these reverses, that when attacked on April 10th at the village of Igani, they scarcely attempted to defend themselves. The flower of the Russian infantry, the Lions of Varna, as they had been called since the Turkish War, laid down their arms, tore the eagles from their shakos, and gave themselves up as prisoners of war. 2,500 were taken. What immediately followed may be told in a few words. Skrizneki failed to follow up his remarkable success, and lost valuable time, in which the Russians recovered from their dismay. The brave Dwarniki, after routing a force of 9,000 with 2,000 men, crossed the frontier and was taken prisoner by the Austrians, who had made no objection to its being crossed by the Russians. And as if nature were fighting against Poland, the cholera, which had crossed from India to Russia and infected the Russian troops, was communicated to the Poles at Igani, and soon spread through their ranks. The climax in this suicidal war came on the 26th of May, when the whole Russian army, led by General Dybitz, advanced upon the Poles. During the preceding night, the Polish army had retreated across the river, Naru, but by some unexplained error, 
had left Lubinsky's corps behind. On this gallant corps, drawn up in front of the town of Ostrolenka, the host of Russians fell, flanked by the Cossacks, who spread out in clouds of horsemen on each wing. The cavalry retreated through the town, followed by the infantry. The fourth regiment of the line, which formed the rear guard, fighting step by step as it slowly fell back. Across the bridges poured the retreating poles. The Russians followed the rear guard hotly into the town. Soon the houses were in flames. Disorder reigned in the streets. The fight continued in the midst of the conflagration. Russian infantry took possession of the houses adjoining the river and fired on the retreating mass. Artillery corps rushed to the river bank and planted their batteries to sweep the bridges. All the avenues of escape were choked by the columns of the invading force. The 4th Regiment, which had been left alone in the town, was in imminent peril of capture, but at this moment of danger it displayed an indomitable spirit. With closed ranks, it charged with the bayonet on the crowded mass before it, rent a crimson avenue through its midst, and cleared a passage to the bridges over heaps of the dead. Over the quaking timbers rushed the gallant poles, followed closely by the Russian grenadiers. The Polish cannon swept the bridge, but the gunners were picked off by sharpshooters and stretched in death beside their guns. On the curving left bank, eighty Russian cannon were planted, whose fire protected the crossing troops. Meanwhile, the bulk of the Polish army lay unsuspecting in its camp. Skrzynecki, the commander, resting easy in the belief that all his men were across, heard the distant firing with unconcern. Suddenly, the imminence of the peril was brought to his attention. Rushing from his tent and springing upon his horse, he galloped madly through the ranks, shouting wildly as he passed from column to column, Ho, Rabinsky! Ho, Malakowski! Forward, forward all! The troops sprang to their feet. The forming battalions rushed forward in disorder. From end to end of the line rushed the generalissimo, the other officers hurrying to his aid. Charge after charge was made on the Russians who had crossed the stream. As if driven by frenzy, the Poles fell on their foes with swords and pikes, singing the Warsaw hymn. The officers rushed to the front. The lancers charged boldly, but their horses sank in the marshy soil, and they fell helpless before the Russian fire. The day passed. Night fell. The field of battle was strewn thick with the dead and dying. Only a part of the Russian army had succeeded in crossing. Skrzynecki held the field, but he had lost 7,000 men. The Russians, of whom more than 10,000 had fallen, recrossed the river during the night, but they commanded the passage of the stream, and the Polish commander gave orders for a retreat on Warsaw, sadly repeating as he entered his carriage Kosciuszko's famous words. Finis Polony. The end indeed was approaching. The resources of Poland were limited, those of Russia were immense. New armies trebly replaced all Russian losses. Field Marshal Paskevich, the new commander at the head of new forces, determined to cross the Vistula and assail Warsaw on the left bank of the stream, instead of attacking its suburb of Praga and seeking to force a passage across the river at that point, as on former occasions. The march of the Russians was a difficult and dangerous one. Heavy rains had made the roads almost impassable, while streams everywhere intersected the country. To transport a heavy pack of artillery and the immense supply and baggage train for an army of 70,000 men through such a country was an almost impossible task, particularly in view of the fact that the cholera pursued it on its march, and the sick and dying proved an almost fatal encumbrance. Had it been attacked under such circumstances by the Polish army, it might have been annihilated. But Skrzynecki remained immovable, although his troops cried hotly for battle, battle, whenever he appeared. The favorable moment was lost. The Russians crossed the Vistula on the floating bridges and marched in compact array upon the Polish capital. And now clamor broke out everywhere. Riots in Warsaw proclaimed the popular discontent. A dictator was appointed, and preparations to defend the city to the last extremity were made. But at the last moment, 20,000 men were sent out to collect supplies for the threatened city, leaving only 35,000 for its defense. 
the russians meanwhile had been reinforced by thirty thousand men making their army one hundred and twenty thousand strong while in cannon they outnumbered the poles three to one such was the state of affairs in beleaguered warsaw on the fatal sixth of september when the russian general taking advantage of the weakening of the patriot army ordered a general assault at daybreak the attack began with a concentrated fire from two hundred guns the troops who had been well plied with brandy rushed in a torrent upon the battered walls and swarmed into the suburb of wola driving its garrison into the church where the carnage continued until none were left to resist from wola the attack was directed about noon upon the suburb of sist this was defended by forty guns which made havoc in the russian ranks while two battalions of the fourth regiment rushing upon them in their disorder strove to drive them back and wrest wola from their hands the effort was fruitless strong reinforcements coming to the russian aid through the blood-strewn streets of the city this struggle continued success favoring now the poles now the russians about five in the afternoon the tide of battle turned decisively in favor of the russians a shower of shells from the russian batteries had fired the houses of sist within whose flame-lit streets a hand-to-hand struggle went on the famous fourth regiment entrenched in the cemetery defended itself valiantly but was driven back by the spread of the flames night fell but the conflict continued the dawn of the following day saw the city at the mercy of the russian host the twenty thousand men sent out to forage were still absent nothing remained but surrender and at nine in the evening the news of the capitulation was brought to the army to whom orders to retire on praga were given thus ended the final struggle for the freedom of poland the story of what followed it is not our purpose to tell the mild alexander was no longer on the russian throne the stern nicholas had replaced him and fearful was his revenge for the crime of patriotism poland was decimated thousands of its noblest citizens being transported to the caucasus and siberia the remnant of separate existence possessed by poland was overthrown and it was made a province of the russian empire even the teaching of the polish language was forbidden the youth of the nation being commanded to learn and speak the russian tongue as for the persecution and suffering which fell upon the poles as a nation it is too sad a story to be here told there is still a polish people but a poland no more end of chapter thirty recording by peter strong sabetha kansas on august fifteenth two thousand eighteen chapter thirty one of historical tales volume eight russian this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org historical tales volume eight russian by charles morris chapter thirty one shamo the hero of Carcassia in the region lying between the black sea and the caspian sea rise the rugged caucasian mountains a mighty wall of rock which there divides the continents of europe and asia monarch of those lofty hills towers the tall peak of elbrus called by the natives the great spirit of the mountains farther east kazbek lifts its lofty summit and at a lower level the whole jagged line the thousand peak caucasus rises into view below these a lower range dark with forests marks its outline on the snowy summits beyond fruitful clearings appear to the height of five thousand feet on the western slopes garden terraces mount the eastward face and the valleys green with meadows or golden with grain are dotted with clusters of cottages sheep and goats browse in great numbers on the hillsides lower down the camel and buffalo feed herds of horses roam half wild through the glades and from the higher rocks the chamois looks boldly down on the inhabited realms below in these mountain fastnesses dwells a race of bold and liberty-loving mountaineers who have preserved their freedom through all the historic eras yielding only at last after years of valiant resistance 
when the whole power of the Russian Empire was brought to bear upon them in their wilds. For years, the heroic Shamil, their unconquerable chief, braved his foes. Again and again he escaped from their toils or hurled them back in defeat, and for a quarter of a century he defied all the power of Russia, yielding only when driven to his final lair. In the Aol, or village of Himri, perched like an eagle's nest high on a projecting rock, this famous chief was born in the year 1797. The only access to this high-seated stronghold was by a narrow path winding several hundred feet up the slope, while a triple wall flanked by high towers further defended it, and the overhanging brow of the mountain guarded it above. Such is the character of one of the strongholds of this mountain land, and such an example of the difficulties its foes had to overcome. There are no finer horsemen than the daring Circassian mountaineers, who are ready to dash at full speed up or down precipitous steeps, to leap chasms, or to swim raging torrents. In an instant, also, they can discharge their weapons, unsling the gun when at full gallop, firing upon the foe, and as quickly returning it to its place. They can rest suspended on the side of the horse, leap to the ground to pick up a fallen weapon, and bound into the saddle again without a halt. And such is the precision of their aim that they are able to strike the smallest mark while riding at full speed. Such were some of the arts in which Shamel was trained, and in which he became signally expert. In the hunt, the trial of skill, all the labors and sports of the youthful mountaineers, he was an adept, and so valiant and resourceful that his admiring countrymen at length chose him as their iman or governor during the defense of their country against the russian invaders the first battle in which shamel engaged was beyond the walls of his native village himri well situated as it was was hurled into ruin by the artillery of the foe and among its prostrate defenders lay shamel with two balls through his body he was left by the enemy as dead and in after years the mountaineers looked upon his escape and recovery as due to miracle shamel was thirty-seven years of age when he became leader of the tribes of middle stature with fair hair gray eyes shadowed with thick brows a grecian nose small mouth and unusually fair complexion he was one of the handsomest and most distinguished in appearance of the mountaineers he was erect in carriage light and active in tread and had a natural nobility of air and aspect. His manner was calmly commanding, while his eloquence was at once fiery and persuasive. Flames sparkle from his eyes, says one, and flowers are scattered from his lips. In 1839, the Russians made one of their most determined efforts to crush the resistance of the mountaineers. Shamel's headquarters were then at Akolgo, a stronghold perched upon the top of an isolated conical peak around whose foot a river wound strong by nature it was well fortified trenches earthworks and covered ways now taking the place of those stone walls which the russian cannon had so easily overturned at Himri. other fortified works were built on the road to akolgo which was retained as a last resort behind whose defences the mountaineers were resolved to conquer or die its garrison was composed of the flower of the Caucasian warriors, while some 15,000 men beside stood ready to take part in the fight. In the month of May, the Russians advanced with such energy and in such force that the interior works were soon taken, and the mountaineers found themselves obliged to take refuge in their final fortress of defense. The fight here was fierce and persistent, Step by step, the Russians made their way, pushing their parallels against the entrenched works of their foes. Point after point was gained, and at length, in late August, the crisis came. A sudden charge carried them into the fort, and the defenders died where they stood, leaving only women and children to fall as prisoners into the Russian hands. But Shamil had disappeared. Seek as they would, the chief was not to be found. The fortress the approaches every nook and corner were explored but the famous warrior for whom his foes would have given half their wealth had utterly vanished no one knew how 
to make sure of his death they had scarcely left a fighting man alive yet to their chagrin the redoubtable shamel was soon again in the field how the brave mountaineer escaped is not known of the stories afloat one is that he lay concealed until night in a rock refuge and then managed to swim the river while some of his friends attracted the attention and drew the fire of the guards all that can be said is that in september he reappeared ready for new feats of arms and was seen again at the head of a gallant body of mountain warriors his headquarters were now fixed at dargo a village in the heart of the mountains and in the midst of the primeval forest but the chief had learned a lesson from his late experience the Circassians were no match for the russians behind fortifications he resolved in the future to fight in a manner better suited to the habits of his followers and to wear out the foe by a guerrilla warfare three years passed before the russians again sought to penetrate the mountains in force then general grab the victor at akulgo attempted to repeat his success at dargo but the experience he gained proved to be of a less agreeable type at the close of the first day's march when the soldiers had eaten their evening meal and stretched their limbs to rest after a hard day's march they were suddenly brought to their feet by a rattling volley of musketry from the surrounding woods all night long the firing continued no great damage being done in the darkness but the soldiers being effectually deprived of their rest when day dawned there was not a circassian to be seen near noon as the column wound through a ravine in the forest the firing sharply recommenced a murderous volley poured upon the vanguard from behind the trees the number of wounded became so great that there were not wagons enough for their transportation still general grab kept on despite the advice of his officers only to be attacked again at night as his weary men lay in a small open meadow among the hills all night long the whiz of bullets drove away repose and at every step of the next day's march the woods belched forth the leaden messengers of death the goal of the march was near at hand the little village of dargo could be seen on a distant hilltop but it was to be reached only by a path of death and the russian commander was at length forced to give the order to retreat on seeing the column wheel and begin its backward march the Circassians grew wild with excitement and triumph slinging their rifles behind their backs they rushed sabre in hand upon the enemy's centre breaking through it again and again while a deadly hail of rifle shots still came from the woods in the end of the column of six thousand two thousand were left dead the remainder reaching the fortress from which they had set out in sorry plight for several years shamel made dargo his headquarters not until eighteen forty five did the russians succeed in taking it their army now being ten thousand strong but it was a village in flames they captured shamel had fired it before leaving and the russians were so beset in coming and going that their empty conquest was made at the cost of three thousand of their men in the spring of the following year the valiant chief repaid the enemy in part for these invasions of his country he had now under his command no less than twenty thousand warriors largely horsemen and in the leafy month of may taking advantage of a weakening of the russian line he dashed suddenly from the highlands for a raid in the neighboring country of the kabardians two rivers flowed between the mountain ranges and the kabardis and two lines of hostile fortresses guarded the frontier containing in all no less than seventy thousand men between the forts lay cossack settlements and beyond them the kabardians an armed and warlike race shamel had no artillery no fortresses no depots of provisions and ammunition all he could do was to make a quick dash and a hasty return down upon the cossacks he rode followed by his thousands of daring riders plundering their villages he halted to take no forts except those that went down in the whirl of his coming before the garrisons and the strongholds fairly knew that he was among them he was gone and while the kabardians believed that he was lurking in the mountain depths he suddenly dashed into their midst sixty populous kabardian villages were plundered and the mountaineers proudly refused to turn till they had watered their horses in the kuban and even reached the more distant banks of the lava but how were they to return thousands of horsemen had gathered in the way 
long battalions of infantry had hurried to cut off the raiders on their retreat shamel knew that he could not get back by the way he had come out turning southward he galloped at headlong speed through the cossack settlements in that quarter and with his cruppers laden with booty and his saddle bows well furnished with food evaded his foes and reached the mountains again may seemed to bloom more richly than ever as the wild riders dashed proudly back to the doors of their homes and heard the glad shouts of joy that greeted their safe return the whole story of the exploits of the famous Circassian chief is too extended and too full of stirring incidents to be here given even in epitome it must suffice to say in conclusion that ten years after his escape from akulgo that stronghold was again attacked and taken by the russians and as before shamel mysteriously escaped completely baffled nothing was left for the russians but to wear out the chief and his people by continued invasions of their mountain land again and again their armies were beaten by their indomitable foe but the continuance of the struggle slowly exhausted the land and its powers of resistance the Caucasians were helped during the crimean war by the foes of russia who supplied them with arms and money but after that war the russians kept up the struggle with more energy than ever and by opening a road over the mountains cut off a part of the country and compelled its submission at length in april eighteen fifty nine twenty-five years after the struggle began wedden shamel's stronghold at that time was taken after a seven weeks siege as before the chief escaped but the country was virtually subdued and he had only a small band of followers left for months afterwards his foes pursued him actively from fastness to fastness determined to run him down and at length on september sixth eighteen fifty nine surprised him on the plateau of gonib here the devoted band made a desperate resistance not yielding until of the original four hundred only forty-seven remained alive shamel the line of the caucasus was at length taken after having cost the russians uncounted losses in life and money with his capture the independence of Caucasia came to an end it has since formed an integral part of the russian empire and its subjugation has opened the gateway to that vast expansion of russia in central asia which since then has taken place the captive chief had won the respect of his foes and was honorably treated being assigned a residence at kaluga in central russia with an annual pension of five thousand dollars he like his countrymen was a mohammedan in faith and removed to mecca in arabia in eighteen seventy dying at medina in the following year end of chapter thirty one recording by peter strom sabetha kansas on august eighteenth two thousand eighteen Chapter 32 of Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris. The Charge of the Light Brigade. The Crimean War, brief as was the interval it occupied in the annals of time, was one replete with exciting events, and of these much the most brilliant was that which took place on the 25th of October, 1854, the famous Charge of the Light Brigade, which Tennyson has immortalized in song, and which stands among the most dramatic incidents in the history of war it was truthfully said by one of the french generals who witnessed it it is magnificent but it is not war we give it for its magnificence alone first let us depict the scene of that memorable event the british and french armies lay in front of bakalava their base of supplies facing towards sebastopol they occupied a mountain slope which was strongly entrenched a valley lay before them and some two miles distant rose another mountain range rocky and picturesque in the valley between were four rounded hillocks each crowned with an earthwork defended by a few hundred turks these outlying redoubts formed the central points of the famous battle of october twenty fifth 
in the early morning of that day the russians appeared in force debouching from the mountain passes in front of the allied army six compact masses of infantry were seen with a line of artillery in front and on each flank a powerful cavalry force while a cloud of mounted skirmishers filled the space between fronting the line of the allies were the zouaves crouching behind low earthworks on the right of the ninety-third highlanders and in front the british cavalry composed of the heavy brigade under general scarlet and more in advance the light brigade under lord cardigan such were in broad outline the formation of the ground and the position of the actors in the drama of the battle about to be played the scene opened with an attack on the advanced redoubts number one was quickly taken the turks flying in haste before the fire of the russian guns number two was evacuated in similar panic haste the cossack skirmishers riding among the fleeing turks and cutting them mercilessly down the guns of number two were at once turned upon number three whose garrison of turks fired a few shots in return and then as in previous cases broke into open flight after them dashed the cossack light horsemen flanking them to right and left and many of the turbaned fugitives paid for their panic with their lives the russians had won in the first move of the game they had taken three of the redoubts before a movement could be made for their support next a squadron of the russian cavalry charged vigorously upon the highlanders but a deadly rifle fire met them as they came volley after volley tearing gaps through their compact ranks and in a moment more they had wheeled opened their files and were in full flight bravo highlanders came up the exulting shout from the thousands of spectators behind it was evident that balaklava was the goal of the russian movement and the heavy cavalry were ordered into position to protect the approaches as they moved toward the post indicated a large body of the enemy's cavalry appeared over the ridge in front these were the corps d'elite evidently their jackets of light blue embroidered with silver lace giving them a holiday appearance behind them as they galloped at an easy pace to the brow of the hill appeared the keen glitter of lance tips and in the rear of the lancers came several squadrons of gray-coated dragoons as supports as the serried ranks of horsemen advanced their pace declined from a gallop to an easy trot and from that almost to a halt their first line was double the length of the british and three times as deep behind it came a second line equally strong they greatly outnumbered their foe it was evident that the shock of a cavalry battle was at hand the hearts of the spectators throbbed with excitement as they saw the heavy brigade suddenly break into a full gallop and rush headlong upon the enemy making straight for the centre of the russian lines on they went greys and inniskilleners in serried array while their cheers and shouts rent the air as they struck the russian line with an impetus which carried them through the close-drawn ranks for a moment there was a glittering flash of sword blades and a sharp clash of steel and then in thin numbers the charging dragoons appeared in the rear of the line heading with unchecked speed toward the second russian rank the gallant horsemen seemed buried amid the multitude of the enemy god help them they are lost came from more than one trembling lip and was echoed in many a fearful heart the onset was terrific the second line was broken like the first and in its rear the red-coated riders appeared but the first line of russians which had been rolled back upon its flanks by the impetuous rush was closing up again and the much smaller force in their midst was in serious peril of being swallowed up and crushed by sheer force of numbers the crisis was a terrible one but at the moment when the danger seemed greatest two regiments of dragoons the fourth and the fifth who had closely followed their fellows in the charge broke furiously upon the enemy dashing through and rending to fragments the already broken line in a moment all was over less than five minutes had passed since the first shock and already the russian horse was in full flight beaten by half its force wild cheers burst forth from the whole army as the victors drew back with almost intact ranks their loss having been very small thus ended the famous charge of the heavy brigade its glory was to be eclipsed by that memorable charge of the light brigade 
which became the theme of Tennyson's stirring ode, and the recital of which still causes many a heart to throb. We are indebted for our story of it to the thrilling account of W. H. Russell, the Times correspondent, and a spectator of the event. As the Russian cavalry retired, their infantry fell back, leaving men in three of the captured redoubts, but abandoning the other points gained. They also had guns on the heights overlooking their position. About the hour of eleven, while the two armies thus faced each other, resting for an interval from the rush of conflict, there came to Lord Cardigan that fatal order which caused him to hurl his men into the jaws of death. How it came to be given, how the misapprehension occurred, who was at fault in the error, has never been made clear. Captain Nolan, who brought the order, was one of the first to fall and his story of the event died with him. All we know is that he handed Lord Lucan a written command to advance, and when asked where are we to advance to, he pointed to the Russian line and said, There are the enemy, and there are the guns, or words of similar meaning. It is a maxim in war that cavalry shall never act without support, that infantry should be close at hand when cavalry carry guns and that a line of cavalry should have some squadrons and column on its flank to guard against a flank attack. None of these rules was carried out here, and Lord Lucan reluctantly gave the order to advance upon the guns, which Lord Cardigan as reluctantly accepted, for to an eye it was evident that it was an order to advance upon death. Someone had blundered, and wisdom would have dictated the demand for a confirmation of the order valor suggested that it should be obeyed in all its blank enormity dismissing wisdom and yielding to valor lord cardigan gave the word to advance the brigade scarcely a regiment in total strength broke into a sudden gallop and within a minute the devoted line was flying over the plain towards the enemy the movement struck lord raglan from whom the order was supposed to have emanated with consternation it struck the russian with surprise surely that handful of men was not going to attack an army in position and so it seemed as the light brigade dashed onward the uplifted sabres glittering in the morning sun the horse galloping at full speed towards the russian guns over a plain a mile and a half in width not far had they gone when a hot fire of cannon musketry and rifles belched from the russian line a flood of smoke and flame hid the opposing ranks and shot and shell tore through the charging troops gaps were rent in their ranks men and horses went down in rapid succession and riderless horses were then rushing wildly across the plain the first line was broken it was joined by the second on went the brigade in a single line with unchecked speed though torn by the deadly fire of thirty guns the brave riders rode steadily on into the smoke of the batteries with cheers which too often changed in a breath to the cry of death through the clouds of smoke the horsemen could be seen dashing up to and between the guns, cutting down the gunners as they stood. Then wheeling they broke through a line of Russian infantry, which sought to stay their advance, and scattered it to right and left. In a moment more, to the relief of those who had watched their career in an agony of emotion, they were seen riding back from the captured redoubt. Scattered and broken they came, some mounted, some on foot, all hastening towards the British lines. As they wheeled to retreat, a regiment of lancers was hurled upon their flank. Colonel Shewell of the Eighth Hussars saw the danger and rushed at the foe, cutting a passage through with great loss. The others had similarly to break their way through the columns that sought to envelop them. As they emerged from the cavalry fight, the gunners opened upon them again, cutting new lines of carnage through their decimated ranks. The heavy brigade had ridden to their relief, but could only cover the retreat of the slender remnant of the gallant band. In twenty-five minutes from the start, not a British soldier, except the dead and died, was left on the scene of this daring but mad exploit. Captain Nolan fell among the first. Lord Lucan was slightly wounded. Lord Cardigan had his clothes pierced by a lance. Lord Fitzgibbon received a fatal wound. Of the total brigade, some six hundred strong, the killed, wounded, and missing numbered four hundred and twenty-six. While this event was taking place, a body of French cavalry made a brilliant charge on a battery at the left. 
which was firing upon the devoted brigade and cut down the gunners but they could not get the guns off without support and fell back with the loss of one-fourth their number thus ended that eventful day in which the british cavalry had covered itself with glory though it had only glory to show in return for its heavy loss such is the story as it stands in prose here is tennyson's poetic version which is full of the dash and daring of the wild ride the charge of the light brigade half a league half a league half a league onward all in the valley of death rode the six hundred forward the light brigade charge for the guns he said into the valley of death rode the six hundred forward the light brigade was there a man dismayed not though the soldier knew someone had blundered theirs not to make reply theirs not to reason why theirs but to do and die into the valley of death rode the six hundred cannon to the right of them cannon to the left of them cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered stormed at with shot and shell boldly they rode and well into the jaws of death into the mouth of hell rode the six hundred flash all their sabres bare flashed as they turned in air sabring the gunners there charging an army while all the world wondered plunged in the battery smoke right through the line they broke cossack and russian reeled from the sabre stroke shattered and sundered then they rode back but not not the six hundred cannon to the right of them cannon to the left of them cannon behind them volleyed and thundered stormed at with shot and shell while horse and hero fell they that had fought so well came through the jaws of death back from the mouth of hell all that was left of them left of six hundred when can their glory fade oh the wild charge they made all the world wondered honor the charge they made honor the light brigade noble six hundred End of chapter 32。Chapter 33 of Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian by charles morris chapter thirty three the fall of sebastopol the history of russia has been largely a history of wars which indeed might be said with equal justice of most of the nations of europe in truth history as written gives such prominence to warlike deeds and glosses over so hastily the events of peace that we seem to hear the roll of the drum rising from the written page itself and to see the hue of blood crimsoning the printed sheets this dominance of war in history is a striking instance of false perspective nations have not spent all or most of their lives in fighting but the clash of the sword rings so loudly through the historic atmosphere that we scarcely hear the milder sounds of peace so far as russia is concerned the torrent of war has rolled mainly towards the south from those early days in which the scythians drove back the persian host and the early varangians fiercely assailed the greek empire the relations of the north and the south have been strained and a rapid succession of wars has been waged between the russians and their varying foes the greeks the tartars and the turks for ten centuries these wars have continued, with Constantinople for their ultimate goal. Yet, in all these ten centuries of conflict, no Russian foot has ever been set in hostility within that ancient city's walls. Of these many wars, that which looms largest on the historic page is the fierce conflict of 1854-55, to in which england and france came to turkey's aid and russia met with defeat on the soil of the crimea 
we have already given the most striking and dramatic incident of this famous crimean war it may be aptly followed by the final scene of all the assault upon and capture of sebastopol the city of this name russian sevastopol is a seaport and fortress on the site of an old tartar village near the southwest extremity of the crimea built by russia as her naval station on the black sea it possesses one of the finest natural harbors of the world and formed the central scene of the crimean war the english and french armies besieging it with all the resources at their command for nearly a year this stronghold of russia was subjected to bombardment battles were fought in front of it vigorous efforts for its capture and its relief were made but in early september eighteen fifty five it still remained in russian hands though frightfully torn and rent by the torrent of iron balls which had been poured into it with little cessation but now the climax of the struggle was at hand and all europe stood in breathless anxiety awaiting the result on september five the fiercest cannonade the city had yet felt was begun by the french the english batteries quickly joining in all that night and during the night of the sixth the bombardment was unceasingly continued and during the seventh the cannons still belched their fiery hail upon the town everywhere the streets showed the terrible effect of this vigorous assault nearly every house in sight was rent asunder by the balls towards evening the great dockyard shears caught fire and burned fiercely in the high wind then prevailing a large vessel in the harbor was next seen in flames and burned to the water's edge this bombardment was preliminary to a general assault fixed for the eighth and on the morning of that day it was resumed as a mask to the coming charge upon the works the malakoff fort the key to the russian position was to be assaulted by the french who gathered in great force in its front during the night the redan another strong fortification was reserved for the british attack in the trenches facing the works men were gathered as closely as they could be packed with their nerves strung to an intense pitch as they awaited the decisive word the hour of noon was fixed for the french assault and as it approached a lull in the cannonade told that the critical moment was at hand at five minutes to twelve the word was given and like a swarm of angry bees the french sprang from their trenches and rushed in mad haste across the narrow space dividing them from the malakoff the place a moment before quiet and apparently deserted seemed suddenly alive a few bounds took the active line of stormers across the perilous interval and within a minute's time they were scrambling up the face and slipping through the embrasures of the long defiant fort on they came stream after stream battalion succeeding battalion each dashing for the embrasures and before the last of the stormers had left the trenches the flag of the foremost was waving in triumph above a bastion of the fort the russians had been taken by surprise very few of them were in the fort the destructive cannonade had driven them to shelter it was in the hands of the french by the time their foes were fully aware of what had occurred then a determined attempt was made to recapture it and the russian general hurled his men in successive storming columns upon the work vainly endeavoring to drive out its captors from noon until seven in the evening these furious efforts continued thousands of the russians falling in the attempt in the end the exhausted legions were withdrawn the french being left in possession of the work they had so ably won and so valiantly held meanwhile the british were engaged in their share of the assault the moment the french tricolor was seen waving from the parapet of the malakoff four signal rockets were sent up and the dash on the redan began it was made in less force than the french had used 
and with a very different result the russians were better prepared and the space to be crossed was wider the assaulting column being rent with musketry as it dashed over the interval between the trenches and the fort on dashed the assailants through the abatis which had been torn to fragments by the artillery fire into the ditch and up the face of the work the parapet was scaled almost without opposition the few russians there taking shelter behind their breastworks in the rear whence they opened fire on the assailing force at this point instead of continuing the charge as their officers implored them to do the men halted and began loading and firing a work in which they were greatly at a disadvantage since the russians returned the fire briskly from behind their shelters every moment reinforcements rushed in from the town and added to the weight of the enemy's fire the assailants were falling rapidly particularly the officers who were singled out by their foes for an hour and a half the struggle continued by that time the russians had cleared the redan but the british still held the parapets then a rush from within was made and the assailants were swept back and driven through the embrasures or down the face of the parapet into the ditch where their foes followed them with the bayonet a short sharp and bloody struggle here took place step by step the band of britons was forced back by the enemy those who fled for the trenches having to run the gauntlet of a hot fire those who remained having to defend themselves against four times their force the attempt had hopelessly failed and of those in the assailing column comparatively few escaped the day's work had been partly a success and partly a failure the french had succeeded in their assault the english had failed in theirs and lost heavily in the attempt what the final result was to be no one could tell silence followed the day's struggle and night fell upon a comparatively quiet scene about eleven o'clock a new act in the drama began with a terrific explosion that shook the ground like an earthquake by midnight several other explosions vibrated through the air here and there flames were seen half hidden by the cloud of dust which rose before the strong wind as the night waned the fires grew and spread while tremendous explosions from time to time told of startling events taking place in the town what was going on under the shroud of night the early dawn solved the mystery the russians were abandoning the city they had so long and so gallantly held the malakoff was the key of their position its loss had made the city untenable the failure of the attempt to recover it was followed by immediate preparations for evacuation the gray light of the coming day showed a stream of soldiers marching across the bridge to the north side the fleet had disappeared it lay sunk in the harbor's depths the retreat had begun at eight o'clock of the evening before soon after the failure to retake the malakoff but it was a moscow the russian general proposed to leave his foes combustibles had been stored in the principal houses about two o'clock flames began to rise from these and at the same hour all the vessels of the fleet except the steamers were scuttled and sunk the steamers were retained to aid in carrying off the stores a terrific explosion behind the redan at four o'clock shook the whole camp four others equally startling followed battery after battery was hurled into the air by the explosion of the magazines before seven o'clock the last of the russians had crossed the bridge to the north side which was uninvested by the allies and the hillsides opposite the city were alive with troops smaller explosions followed from a steamer in the harbor clouds of dense smoke arose flames spread rapidly and by ten o'clock the whole city was in a blaze while vast columns of smoke rose far into the skies lurid in the glare of the flames below
the sounds of battle had ceased those of conflagration and ruin succeeded the final flames were those sent up from the steamers which were set on fire when the work of transporting stores had ceased great was the surprise throughout the camp that sunday morning when the news spread that sebastopol was on fire and the enemy in full retreat most of the soldiers worn out with their desperate day's work slept through the explosions and woke to learn that the city so long fought for was at last theirs or so much of it as the flames were likely to leave about midnight attracted by the dead silence some volunteers had crept into an embrasure of the redan and found the place deserted by the foe as soon as dawn appeared the french zouaves began to steal from their trenches into the burning town heedless of the flames the explosions and the danger of being shot by some lurking foe the desire for plunder being stronger in their minds than dread of danger soon the red uniforms of these daring marauders could be seen in the streets revealed by the flames and the day had but fairly dawned when men came staggering back laden with spoils russian relics being offered for sale in the camps while the russian columns were still marching from the deserted city the sailors were equally alert and could soon be seen bearing more or less worthless lumber from the streets often useless stuff which they had risked their lives to gain the allies had won a city in ruins but they had defeated the russians at every encounter in field and in fort and the muscovite resources were exhausted the war must soon cease what followed was to complete the destruction which the torch had began the splendid docks which russia had constructed at immense cost were mined and blown up the houses which had escaped the fire were robbed of doors windows and furniture to add to the comfort of the huts which were built for winter quarters by the troops as for the scene of ruin disaster and death within the city it was frightful and it was evident that the russians had clung to it with a death grip until it was impossible to remain it was an absolute ruin from which the sebastopol of today began its growth end of chapter 33 recording by linda johnson